The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> Once upon a time there was a frog who lived in a pond. He looked at his family and his friends, and he said to them the following, I am really sick and tired of listening to you croak and leap. With that, there was a hush, a collective pause by all other, other frogs, and he went on and he said, just look at all the patches on your skin, the silliness of your feet. You look and you sound ridiculous. To which they replied, but you're one of us. And the frog continued, I am much more deserving of someone of a higher stature than all of you. And with that, he puffed out his chest, he croaked, and he hopped away. Now the frog lived by himself for quite some time on the opposite end of the pond, right over there by those lilies that were on the water. And one day that someone special came along for the frog. It was a massive, humongous ox. The ox had been wandering all day long and was quite thirsty, came down to the edge of the water. Now you can imagine the excitement of the frog. He began to croak and he began to hop. And he got closer and closer to the ox and the ox bent his head down, took a few sips. He was very thirsty, you see. And the frog got right up to his face, croaking the whole time, but the ox didn't even notice. The oxen continued to drink, and after he had his fill, he made a comment, just out loud, saying, look at how beautiful are these lilies. And he smelled and took in their amazing fragrance, but he still didn't notice the frog, who continued to puff out his chest and croak and croak and puff and puff. He got two times, three times the size of his body. He's hopping around frantically just to get observed and say, oh dear ox, you and I belong with one another. Will you please notice me? I am right here. And the ox continued to look with amazement about how the light reflected off of the water. Now, frantic, the frog puffs out again and again and croaks and puffs and eventually poof. He was gone. The moral of the story is that if you continue to puff yourself up, you will surely croak. <laughs> I have kids here, so I've got to make it, you know, something worthwhile for them to understand and also relate to what we have heard in today's Holy Scripture out of the Bible. We have two passages that I'm going to point our attention to. The first is going to be right to the heart of the matter, the gospel. What are we to make out of this situation where Jesus comes into the temple to teach? And not only to teach, but to teach with something that wasn't like the scribes who've been doing it day in and day out, but he was teaching with authority. And we had talked about this a little last Sunday. He's teaching with authority. And in the context of this, and if you want to look at your customary uh, uh, painting that we illustrated here this morning from James to So, it shows Jesus going into the temple, a bewildered look and a sense of frustration from all of the scribes. The rolls of the Torah are all in the background. And there is this man tormented, and Jesus is rebuking him, and it looks like he's got a whip or something in his hand. That's a strong body posture. 
on how he is relating to that person considered to have an unclean spirit. So let's just hold that for a second because we can't truly understand it, I don't think, unless we unpack what we hear Paul say to his believers of Jesus Christ in the church of Corinth. In that first letter that he writes to them, how does he begin? He says, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. Knowledge puffs up. Do you believe that's a true statement? Does knowledge puff up? I thought knowledge was a good thing. And I would assume that in the days of Paul that he would have considered that would be a good thing too. I mean, who doesn't want to have knowledge? Furthermore, Paul continues to say in his letter that everyone admittedly has knowledge. It's experiential training just to live, to gather knowledge. But there he says knowledge can puff up. It's the context of which he is looking at those people in that area of Greece to where he's saying specifically this is how it looks. In the context of their day, he said, be careful, do not. He gives strong rebuke to eating the meat that is sacrificed to idols. Wow, how do we get that to correlate with what's happening in the temple with Jesus? Again, we have to be patient. We have to be kind to the text. We can't boast, we can't be prideful over this one. We have to discern it. In the day of Paul, in the day of the Roman Empire, there were many gods. It was a polytheistic pond to which there was a lot of bellowing of pride. There was a lot of croaking of self-righteousness. And whoever had knowledge had power. The knowledge that was there in the center of his community was one of great tension. And when he looked at that, he said, beware that you don't get puffed up with knowledge, but rather you build up with love. Why meat being sacrificed to idols, to God specifically? It was very common in that time to which there was a homage paid to those who had power and power especially with their connection with the dead. It was a very popular thing that if you came from a successive genealogy, that you had a relationship with those who had popularity or power, that you could convey that to the rest by your knowledge. If you eat the food in a certain way, if you come and have a celebration with the understanding that it's in not only memorial, but it's in worship, of that beloved dead person that belonged to my family for years, then you too will be grafted in to this semblance of belonging. They used that in order to attract people that were in a weakened position. Now this doesn't happen today. We don't have meat being sacrificed to idols anymore, do we? Oh, but contrary, yes we do. There are many idols that still lurk out today. I mean, just in our last decade, we can admittedly say that there was significant pressures to which we had to pay homage, a routine, in a certain way to fuel and to feed power. That's happening right now. We are seeing it lived out that these sacred assemblies of one who croaks the loudest and puffs out their chest the most is able to convey to the others, especially the least and the less, that they are the ones who hold the true authority in the world. Who was it that said, um, power corrupts, but uh, what is it? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that statement is true today as it was in the days of Paul. Those who seek out absolute power, which does not allow or incline reason, classical thinking, conversation, when it becomes an insistent on your own sense of value, that value, dearly beloved, can sincerely represent an idol and a god. We must be cautious. As much as we think that we can point a finger to those who are already in absolute power and have all reason and knowledge in their own base camp, we have to be careful because 
there is an evolution to get there. It's an unusual variety, but self-abasement is also a form of pride. And that says, no one listens to me, and I'm going to raise my voice because my knowledge of being oppressed is more important than your own values. It becomes a God of their own to shame and to guilt. So we've got the two extremes, one that wants to conserve the power and one that wants to liberate for new power. And in between that, we're all just a bunch of frogs on the pond, hearing the bellows and the croaks of those who say they're more deserving of someone of higher stature. So I want to bring that now to the gospel. And here we see Jesus right there in the pond, if you will, the temple of all places. And the temple in Jesus' day was the place of influence. It was the place of civic discourse. It was a place of authority. It was a place of politics. It was a place of business. It was the place. So when Jesus came into this place, I don't know if he would have a different reaction than if he came into our place today, right? Because we do everything we can not to let those things infiltrate our church and rot our spiritual well-being. We are insistent and intentional about having only one God that we worship through Jesus Christ here in this sacred assembly. But we're also a people of reason. We like to have conversation. We might go into the parish hall later, might talk a little bit after and linger. What was that we heard in the gospel today? What was that reading in Deuteronomy all about? What is it meant by the psalmist who spoke about this? We come and we reason together, and maybe it sounds a little ridiculous to those that don't understand the God that we worship. But this is who we are with our warts and our blemishes and our silly little feet. But we come in earnestness to work it out together, a body that believes in Jesus. So Jesus is between those that are croaking and those that are bellowing. The massive body, I would argue, are the scribes, the people who had a succession of power that was handed down to them, and they were wielding it unmercifully to the point of, do not object, do not say anything against what the Torah says, do not have any object reasoning. What we say matters, and it is knowledge and truth and wisdom. Shut up and obey. I have a feeling that was the posture of the scribes in the temple of that day. And Jesus comes in. Now, he could have rebuked them for what they've been doing for all these years. He will get to that in another gospel reading, I assure you. But today, the treatment is towards a man with unclean spirit. And with that, are you not a little bit surprised that a group that had such a monopoly on authority would allow a man with an unclean spirit to come into the temple? almost sounds like it was set up. Let's let this person rough handle this Jesus, and let's see how he reacts to it. And oh boy, did he step up to the plate. He looked at that man, and this is where it gets a little interesting. He rebukes him when the man says, I know who you are. I know that you are the Holy One sent by God. The recognition, you see, of not just sinfulness, but an embedded sinfulness that has been going on for a long time in this man's life. You could almost make the point that he has a resident evil within him. And this evil recognized the contrast when light was shined on him, and he saw that in the countenance of Jesus. And Jesus changed that man immediately, told him to leave, let that spirit leave you, and allow for God to enter in. It's a very weird variety of pride, human pride, that exists as a victim. This victim demands attention, and Jesus wasn't going to give anything to it. Through me, you are not a victim. You are an inheritor to be a prince, to be part of a kingly generation. But he had to send the sin and the evil out of that man. So here we are. Who's the ox in the, this parable or in, I mean, in the story of the gospel? It's the scribes. 
They were so big, all that they could look at was a reflection of the light on the water and the fragrance of the lilies, and they had no consideration for the little ones. They were abusing, turning away from their God-given responsibilities. So there you have it. That's the scene that we have today. And Paul, in his eighth chapter, is going to make sure that in his 13th chapter, he's going to make up and tell you how love builds up. Because if we just hang on knowledge puffs up, we're going to be a rotten mess. We need to grow and nurture and build out of this understanding. Am I that little frog or am I that big ox? And Paul says so well in a passage that we hear every single wedding ceremony, love is patient, love is kind, love does not boast, it does not take pride. It does not insist on its own ways. How many times have we sensed in our lives the insistence of pride from those, even our own family and friends, even our own church? What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to love them. We're supposed to be patient and kind. And we don't insist on our own ways. I'm preaching to myself. And I hope that you can join me around the pond and know what a fitting place that God has given each of us to not puff up on our knowledge, but to live and to be built up by the love that comes from Christ, who gives us the strength to do all of these things. So dearly beloved, as we go forward, especially as I'm speaking to the church as a whole, and today being a special day with the annual parish meeting, when we go forth to love and serve the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord, what is the moral of our story? Let us not be puffed up, because if we do, as a church, we will surely croak. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.